Egypt's president fires the powerful military leadership, asserting his powers as a civilian leader. Does that end the showdown with the army? Is Egypt on its way to full civilian rule? Or is it just the Muslim Brotherhood tightening its grip on the country? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme with me, David Foster. He has only been in power for two months, but would appear Mohamed Morsi is keen to stamp his authority on Egypt. In a move that surprised the country, he dismissed the Chief of Armed Forces, Field Marshal Hussein Tantawi, and his number two, General Sami Anan. In total, seven members of the military's top brass were removed days after the Chief of Intelligence was fired over the recent attacks in Sinai. Raya Rage reports. Tahrir Square celebrating yet another political victory. Supporters of President Morsi welcoming his bold move, chanting, Go away, Field Marshal. After a long battle for power with the military, Morsi's surprise move sent a message that he is in charge. General Abdel Fattah al Sisi, the former head of military intelligence, replaced Field Marshal Mohammed Hussein Tantawi as defense minister. Tantawi had been in the post for more than 20 years. Out too was the army's chief of staff, General Sami Anan. In a speech Sunday night, Morsi praised the armed forces and said he wanted them to concentrate on protecting the nation. The decisions I've taken today are not directed at any specific person, and I did not intend to embarrass any institution or narrow the freedom of people born free. I did not intend to direct my decision at any particular person to send a negative message or bad intention. And God knows what I meant by these decisions. I meant the good interest of this nation and these people. In addition to the sackings, Morsi annulled the controversial supplementary constitutional declaration that transferred much of his power to the military, instead issuing his own, giving the president full executive and legislative powers. And it was this move that was particularly welcomed in Tahrir. Morsi's decisions were made a week after an ambush in the Sinai left 16 Egyptian soldiers dead, the security lapse providing a solid opportunity for the president to make sweeping changes to the military. A senior general said the dismissals were made in consultation with the military council. Some analysts say the new defense minister, Sisi, also a member of the council, was key in engineering the shakeup. Well, the military in Egypt played a pivotal role in the foundation of the modern state. After overthrowing the country's monarchy in 1952, all four of the country's leaders since have been military officers, a trend which changed with Mohamed Morsi. The military has historically been held in pretty high regard by the Egyptian people who praised their refusal to fire on peaceful demonstrators during the revolution. But many Egyptians have grown tired of the military's privileged position in society. There are estimates that their vast business empire, which include construction, hotel and petrol industries, is worth about 20% of Egypt's economy. So is it the beginning of a real transition to civilian rule in Egypt? To discuss this, we're joined by a guest in Cairo, Abdullah Lashal, former presidential candidate. Also in Cairo, Dina Zakaria, who talks on behalf of the Muslim Brotherhood and out of New York, Michael Wahid Hanna, a fellow at the Century Foundation. Welcome to all three of you. Uh, Mr. Alashal, to you first of all. When a man such as Field Marshal Hussein Tantau has been in power for as long as he has, and those around him, and he is sacked. Why has there been no real protest from him? Um, I think uh, the military council uh, led by uh, Mr. Tantawi uh, was insisting to stay in power. All the indications were confirming that. And I think also that they were trying to make Mr. Morsi fail in achieving his program. And this would be a good plea for them uh, to dismiss him. And some rumors were surrounding the works of the, uh, the Constitution Commission that the Constitution will start everything, including new elections for the president. So I think um, um, uh, this atmosphere, in fact, 
was, was very much in, in the mind of Mr. Morsi. But I don't think that something was attacking the, the military by Mr. Morsi. I think but, there but is I, some I, sort I can sort of understand of why Mr. Morsi would want to put himself in that position. What I find quite hard to understand at, the, at this moment is why somebody like Field Marshal Tantawi, who, who wouldn't really want to give up power, as you say, seems to go quietly. Yes, I, I think there are two reasons for that. First, perhaps Mr. Morsi was convincing him that after the Rafah incident, it's very difficult for him to continue. And this was a big scandal for the military leadership. And at the same time, the military council, in fact, doesn't have any justification to continue its role uh, beside Mr. Morsi in a partnership. The second reason is that uh, he himself was very tired. And I don't think that he was very much ready to continue uh, the march uh, for uh, an endless point. Um, and at the same time, I, I feel also that, that some sort of uh, satisfaction had been given to the field marshal as well, um, uh, and including also some satisfaction to the other military leaders who uh, are sort of around a, a, him. A, a, a so graceful way out by accepting this, this sinecure as, as a presidential advisor, perhaps. Uh, Adina Zakaria, let, let me go to you. Uh, Mr. Alashal there yes. mentioned the, the terrible events in Sinai where uh, 16 members of the military were killed. And, and he suggests that this was a reason why uh, the president had to get rid of the head of the military. W was it a, a reason or an excuse? Okay, let me just start saying that what happened in Sinai was just a step forward uh, for Dr. Morsi to uh, take the chance to confront, uh, from my point of view, to confront the uh, 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 this CAF, the military council, about uh, their negative uh, uh, attitude and being so involved in political situation and leaving the borders without securing. So I think it's a good, uh, it was a good chance for him to make use of that in spite of the fact that this uh, uh, situation was um, really yeah. brought grief for all Egyptians. But, but was he but always looking for the, president... the excuse, the reason to do it? If it hadn't been Sinai, would it have been something else but, very soon? And no, no, I just want to continue my point of view because you, you have just started by, the position, by, by, by that situation. But let me tell you that what President Morsi have done yesterday about his decisions, and uh, he, he, we were all, we, all of us, we were waiting for him to do that because he is the elected president by, by most of Egyptians from different streams, waiting for him to respond to their demands, one of which was to do, was to, uh, uh, to retire uh, 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 Tantawi and also to cancel the uh, constitutional uh, 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 suggestions that were, uh, were, ha were t that have taken place by Tantawi and so on. So what what President Morsi ha ha has done was really expected by everyone. Maybe not yesterday, but we were expecting that from him. Yeah. So sometime he was always going to have to do it, uh, Mr. Hanna. If I could come to you in New York, I is this the end of real power being held by the military? in Egypt, or will it just go into, a, into the shadows for a little while, still pull some strings, and still remain extremely wealthy and influential? Well, I mean, I think it's too soon to say. I think clearly at this point, uh, the military appears to be acquiescing, whether this is out of uh, hesitation of carrying out a coup, which would have been the only real step to counter uh, the president's decisions with respect to Tantawi Anen uh, and the constitutional declaration, or whether this was coordinated with other generals, uh, the, the bottom line is that now the military appears to be acquiescing to this. Um, what this does is it removes formal political authority from, this, uh, from the council. And I think that's quite important and significant. Uh, it's clear, though, that they are an important institutional player in Egypt. Uh, but how that manifests itself will have to be different. Uh, and it's unclear at this stage uh, what the appetite is of the remaining military officers in charge uh, is to play that type of political role. And of course, we don't know what sort of arrangements have been made, if at all, between those military officers who remain uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood. So uh, and will, I think will it's that too early to say the military is obviously. Will that relationship become more clear Sorry, when we see whether the, going the to be Supreme quite important and influential Constitutional going Court steps into this. If the Supreme Constitutional Court steps in and says, hang on, Mr. President, what you're doing is, is unconstitutional, strange as that may seem, since there is no real constitution at the moment, if it steps in, would that suggest that um, 
somebody like Tantawi and the, the stronger men historically in the military are not going to go away quietly. And if, if it doesn't, would that suggest that the more junior people in the military are, are quite happy to accept the status quo as it's been set out now? Well, obviously, the Supreme Court has played a political role during this transition uh, and has weighed in, particularly with respect to dissolving parliament, essentially, uh, on the side of a transition roadmap as laid out by the SCAF. Uh, so the courts are, have been politicized, uh, and they've played an active role. Now, the question is, in the face of what appears to be acquiescence on the part of the military, uh, would the courts now enter into this dispute, which is really a political dispute, uh, which could really uh, put its reputation on the line. Uh, and, I, and I think that's a very fateful step, and I'm not sure if the court is going to be willing to take that burden on uh, in light of the political atmosphere at present. Well, let, let me put that to, to Mr. Alashale in Cairo. Do you think the judiciary has got any appetite to step in to this? I mean, it has done in the past and, and very recently. Uh, I think uh, a large uh, type of deal had been uh, drafted between Mr. Morsi and the military uh, so to, to satisfy everybody and to convince them that uh, he is the head of the state and he should do even whatever they want for the army to be done. For the judiciary, I think uh, this collaboration between the military and the judiciary, especially the constitutional court, was something very exposed, and the many hazards were surrounding this uh, collaboration. And this is why I think they are now um, trying to be uh, far away, and this is why also one of the reasons why he picked up uh, one of the judiciary to be his vice president as well. Uh, Donna, let me ask you this one. I mean, when you look at the new defence chief replacing Field Marshal Tan Tawi, uh, he's not exactly somebody that... Uh, many of the revolutionaries, the younger people in, in Cairo might warm to. He was, after all, the man who admitted that the forces were carrying out virginity tests on women last year and said that this was fine because it protected his soldiers from accusations of sexual molestation. So, so it's not exactly a new dawn, is it? I really want to congratulate all Egyptians about that choice because that person um, has a good, very uh, or great reputation amongst the, uh, the army soldiers and generals and so on. So I think that uh, being um, related to the category of youth and still reflecting the uh, image of 25th of uh, revolution, uh, starting first by the prime minister and then now we have the uh, uh, minister of defense uh, from this, uh, the same category. We are very proud of, of choosing someone like that because I was uh, trying to see the reflection of that choice uh, on people yesterday. People but, that but I, I have was read talking to, they were so happy about that. In the last few that. hours, that he is a man yes. who has been very close to Field Marshal Tantawi, that he was, uh, as I mentioned, the, yeah. the, the man who said, yes, it was okay to carry out virginity tests on those arrested during the protest because it protected his soldiers from accusations of sexual molestation. Uh, being so close to Tantawi, it's not a, a, neg a negative point, it's a positive point, which means that he is having all the files of everything, he, he, is knowing, he knows everything. But at the same time, uh, he was having a, a, a very good situation uh, from what you have mentioned, that example you have mentioned now. Uh, so I think that most of the people now following this decision are really welcoming choosing that person to be the Minister of Defence after Tantawi. You approve of him, even with the matter of the, the virginity tests on the protesters last year? Yes. This, this situation that he mentioned, it, it's for his side. It's a, it's a positive point with him. He was the only one witnessed or say, he, he, he mentioned that uh, thing. He is the f only one who said or talked about that. Okay, let me go back to, to Mr. Alashal at, at the moment and, and ask about the, the military's role in the future. It is extremely wealthy. Those at the top have made uh, a very nice living for themselves over the years. It accounts for something like one-fifth of all of the wealth produced in Egypt. What role will it now have? Yes, I, I think we have to make the distinction between the political role and the economic status of the army. The army will remain for some time uh, a very strong uh, economic partner with the state because um, it is supposedly uh, occupying about 40% of the whole economy of Egypt. And this is why it's very difficult to dissociate them from the economic life. 
and to get them aside. We have to make a program so as the army would be very much confined to the army needs and uh, whatever is commercial or be, could be commercialized by the state should be re referred to the state. But for the political point of view, I think the political life now has to be purely for politicians, not for the army. And I think um, all the public here in Egypt are calling for that. And this uh, was one of the, uh, of the targets of the revolution. And even the people here, after the very bad management of the country and the transition period, um, everybody is very happy that the military uh, now are taking their way to the camps and also uh, to the barracks. Uh, and, Mr. Uh, Hanna, so, sorry, I'll come back to you in just a moment, Mr. Al Shah. But, Mr. Hanna, in, in New York, would it be naive to, to assume, as um, our other guest is saying, that they're, they're happy to have their power taken away, that they're happy to return to barracks? I mean, is that the last we've seen politically of the military in Egypt after all these years? Well, I, I think it's, it's important to put this in perspective. The past 18 months of, of direct political role for the military are an anomaly. Uh, by the end of the Mubarak regime, the military was the silent guarantor of, of the regime's stability, uh, but it didn't have necessarily an active political role. Uh, that was reserved for the president and his inner circle. So, you know, this is uh, not no the norm for the military in terms of exercising direct political authority. Uh, now, clearly, the ambitions of some military officers change with, with, uh, in reaction to uh, the uprising in January of January 2011. Um, it's unclear now with this, uh, with the sidelining of Tantawi and Anen, if this represents uh, a new direction, perhaps a, a, a shift with respect to how the military wants to position itself politically, uh, whether it sees its institutional interests still served by that frontline uh, political position. Uh, it seems at this point uh, that these moves by Morsi in establishing a clear alliance of civilian authority over military power, uh, that the opportunity to do that, whether uh, people within the military would like to or not, is is circumscribed. But, but uh, when, when so we come to... I think how I, the military would... Sorry, do finish your sentence. I apologize. No, I mean, uh, how the military would, uh, would be able to exercise power now would be quite different. It is in, through indirect means... Uh, through its institutional weight and its authority. Uh, but, you know, I think it's also too soon to say that, that now this represents the full uh, exercise of su civilian supremacy over the military, uh, the establishment of the military. So well, let's look I, back I think just, uh, this just is a yet few to weeks. play itself out. Uh, when Mohamed Morsi said to the dissolved parliament, look, I want, I want you to come together, I want you to meet, and it didn't last very long, about 15 days, but he made the point that this institution would now be sort of in charge of putting together the, the, the skeleton of a new constitution. And once that constitution had been voted on in a referendum, there would be elections within 60 days. I, is that a, a likely path, do you think, to, to be followed, Mr Hanna? Well, I think for the parliament, I think that's right. I mean, once the, the, uh, the Constituent Assembly is now working, uh, and it's unclear what timetable it is working on, uh, some of them, some of the projections are quite soon. I, I think implausibly soon. Uh, but there is a, you know, a huge gap now with no legislative authority and the concentration of all of those powers within the executive branch. Um, I think there's a huge gap at the moment and an, an excessive concentration of power in the hands of the president. So, yes, uh, you know, parliamentary elections loom large, uh, and I'm sure that uh, many among other political forces. Uh, will be picking up on this point uh, because it, the extended uh, the extended hold of the president on, on all the leather, levers of authority, I think, is something that we should be worried about. Uh, Dina Zakaria, is, is there not a danger uh, if the constitution is written in such a way as to help the Muslim Brotherhood at the moment that its opponents, when those elections come around? Uh, will be handicapped, and that would actually amount effectively to, to a, an Islamist coup, if you like, inside Egypt. No, I don't consider it like that because now the Constitutional Committee now that's formed, it's representing different streams in Egypt, liberals, secularisms, and people from church and uh, from uh, Al-Azhar, and 
from different political streams. Uh, it's very clear to everyone now they are working so hard. No Islamist uh, uh, manipulation over that kind of committee. So the committee now is doing its job. And um, I have attended one of the meetings with one of their committees to listen to our demands and others' demands. It was so open. Everyone is saying whatever he wants and, and, and whatever he's aiming to see in Egypt. So let me tell you that I think that this committee is going to reflect uh, the real constitution that the Egyptians want to have. It's not a danger. But afterwards, this constitution will be represented to all Egyptians. And there, there will be, uh, 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 they will vote for it, saying yes or no. And later on, there will be, inshallah, another parliament election. Let me remind you, because uh, my colleague was talking about uh, Dr. Morsi's uh, decision, and you were asking him about that, having uh, an election, parliament, a parliamentary election after the constitution. The president, uh, a month before, w called back for the parliament to, to again to do its work just for a while till the constitution took place, which means that he didn't want to have uh, the legislation power and the executive power in his hand. But as you saw, and what happened, that the, judici the, the judiciary power interfered. But later on, now the, I think that Dr. Morsi is taking the right step forward to hold over power from the military power and then to continue uh, uh, establishing for the real civil country under uh, uh, ruling by the state of law. No, not Islamists and no other streams will manipulate anything. It's going to be just a state of law. Former presidential candidate Abdullah al Shah, let me come to you now uh, as we come towards the end of the programme. The Muslim Brotherhood would appear to have lost some of its gloss as, as an electable party uh, within the last eight months. If you look at the, the soundings that people have taken and, and the views of a lot of political commentators within Egypt, therefore the fear among some people is that it will try to manipulate the constitution to give itself an extra leg up when it comes to new elections. Uh, what dangers do you see in the coming months in terms of putting together the framework for Egypt's political future? No, I don't think that uh, these fears ha are grounded in Egypt because uh, the Constitution Commission is nearly finishing its work now in drafting the Constitution. Uh, and I think that uh, what Dr. Morsi did in, uh, uh, in the new uh, declaration that he, he declared yesterday that he is replacing himself, uh, putting himself in the seat of the military council if any uh, problem occurs for uh, the Constitution Commission in the future. But anyhow, I think the Muslim Brotherhood are trying to, to descend themselves to satisfy all the other uh, groups uh, and to feel that there is a consensus among uh, all the, the factions. And uh, this spirit, in fact, that we are reflected in many of their behaviors. So this is why I don't think that the concentration of power, legislative and executive, in the hands of Dr. Morsi for transitional period and for necessity only uh, could um, constitute a mm. hazard for Egypt in the future. So from, your, from your point of view, is this a very important step, what we've seen in the last few days? Very important, very crucial, because beyond all that, we are dissociating from the military establishment and trying to establish a new civil and democratic regime. And this is a, uh, something which had been expected since a very long time. And in fact, we lost hope that the military would be uh, infusing themselves everywhere. And this was the big battle between the military and the civilian. And we thank God that this had been passing very smoothly without any repercussions in the future, inshallah. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to all of the guests on this edition of Inside Story in Cairo. Just been hearing from Abdullah al Ashal, former presidential candidate. Also in Cairo, Dina Zakaria, representing the Muslim Brotherhood. And out of New York, we had Michael Wahid Hanna. Thank you all very much indeed. And thank you to you, those of us who, those of you who've tuned in for this edition of Inside Story. If you want to send us your feedback, email your thoughts to Inside Story at aljazeera.net. That's aljazeera.net. For me, David Foster, and the rest of the team, thanks for watching. Bye bye for now.